Christians have to answer the question, what is Hosea talking about? Hosea describes the last period of Jewish history to be a time of exile with no king, no sacrificial system. Just think. If you're a Christian, I want you to pay careful attention to what period is Jose referring. Now, if you're a Christian, this is a monumental question. Because in Christian theology, we have a king, and that's Jesus. Okay, so uh, call your live on the air. Please tell us name. Where are you calling from? Good morning. I would like to, this is my question to Rabbi Tobia. Do you believe Yeshua HaMashiach? If not, where do Yeshua come from? Thank you so much. I know that if we go to the Vatican, we're going to get an answer. If we go to a full theological seminary, we'll receive an answer. If we go to Dallas Theological, an answer. But what is the God of Israel think? That's how I want you to think. And that is, like, what is God's opinion? Scripture tells us what the Messiah will accomplish, what he will do. And there is no relationship at all between what Jesus purportedly did during the first century and what the Messiah is supposed to do. And that's why people who are true followers of the God of Israel, they don't want to be a master. They want to be a servant to the God of Israel. Reject the core tenets of the Christian religion. What does the Bible say? Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, 3, 4, clearly describes a world in which all the nations will be guided by the teachings of the Messiah, who will rebuke the nations. They will listen to him. The result, they'll take the swords and spears and turn them into plowshares and pruning hooks. La yisa goyo gocherv, la yumudu od milchama. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither will they learn of war anymore. The Bible, the word of God, intimately connects the universal knowledge of God with worldwide peace. In the view of the God of Israel, the real root of war is ideological. And if people were servants of the God of Israel alone and worship no other God, then they would be of the same accord. And in fact, the Bible tells us in Siphania, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9, that the nations will speak in those days in a Safa Brura, in a pure speech. So people will speak alike, and they will praise only the God of Israel, who will be king of the whole world. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9. The whole world will acknowledge the one God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The time period for the last exile is a very long time. Hosea tells us in chapter 3, verse 4 and 5, that the children of Israel will abide for many days. It means a very long time without a king, without a sacrifice, without any of these things, until the end of days when the children of Israel return to the Lord and to David, his servant. David here means the Messiah. Christians have to answer the question, what is Hosea talking about? Hosea describes the last period of Jewish history to be a time of exile with no king, no sacrificial system. Just think. If you're a Christian, I want you to pay careful attention to what period is Hosea referring. Now, if you're a Christian, this is a monumental question. Because in Christian theology, we have a king, and that's Jesus. In fact, the letters that are supposedly inscribed above the cross is that Jesus is king. It means we have a king in Christian theology. In Christian theology, we have a sacrifice. According to Hosea, the last period of Jewish history will be marked by a time where there's no king, there's no prince, there's no sacrifice, none of those things until the end of days. 
Now, how will you bring offerings? Well, you're not going to bring the sacrificial system. You're not going to employ it because instead of bulls, neshama parm sefazenu. So the Bible tells us that there'll be a temple that will stand forever in Jerusalem. Then they will know that I am Lord. I encourage you to read Ezekiel 37, verse 26 through 28. You might be asking yourself, like, what's going on here? It's not like these books I'm quoting from are a secret that no one has access to. These are very, very well-known passages. In fact, some of these passages are so well-known that they are enshrined in the United Nations. Isaiah chapter 2 is so famous that it made it to the Isaiah Wall across from the UN on the east side of Manhattan. The New Testament didn't have the insight to inscribe it in its canon. You'll find Isaiah 2 nowhere in the New Testament. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 10, which describes the same thing. Everyone will serve the Messiah. They will listen to him. War will come to an end. What's happening right now in Ukraine, in Russia, in Syria, in Lebanon will come to an end. If that stuff is going on, it means the Mashiach is not here. But Jesus made me feel good, and I stopped doing drugs, and you don't know how he's changed my life. Not relevant. Your personal experience is not relevant because, as you know, people of every religion go through enormous transformation because of their newfound religion. That's just the way it is. So that's not relevant. You don't pray over this. You look to the Bible over this. Now, if you disagree with me, if you think that the Bible is not our final source for edification, you should not be watching me because that's the core foundation of my faith. That's what I operate out of. So if you operate out of a different system, you don't want to watch me. You don't watch your show. It's a waste of your time. It's only about what does the Bible say. It's not about the Lord spoke to me. I feel better. I've been, I did heroin. I stopped doing heroin. I've been smoking. It's all religions. The nation of Israel returned back to the land of Israel, Isaiah chapter 43. In fact, just read Isaiah 43, and you'll see so many messianic prophecies come into view, the resurrection of the dead, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. You're asking me, like, why don't I believe in Jesus? Because there's, there's nothing about the first century where any of these prophecies were filled. And everything that Christians say that Jesus did is exactly what the Messiah is not supposed to do. Moreover, the very opposite occurred in the first century. There was no world peace during the first century, but there was war, so much war. The worst of it, between 66 and 70 when the Jews went to war with Rome, which caused their expulsion from the land of Israel. It triggered an exile and the death of so many, not a resurrection of the dead and not a building of a temple, but the destruction of the temple. All those things occurred during the first century. And if anybody tells you, listen very carefully, that there's a second coming and that's when he's going to do all those things, so you know that you're encountering a false religion. That's the red flag. So there's nothing like a second coming in Tanakh. And anytime you hear it's the second coming and it's going to happen the second time around, immediately run for your life. Immediately leave skin marks because that means it's not of God. The teaching is not of the Almighty. That's all. Second comings explain away every false messiah. And they all had to maintain the idea of a second coming, including David Koresh, who at the very least had a name that's the name of the Messiah according to the Bible, David. No person who reads the Hebrew Bible will then come to the conclusion that Jesus is the Messiah. No one will. Messiah is not supposed to die for anybody's sins. And in order to have such a reading, you have to read a chapter of Isaiah 53, and make sure you do not read the chapters that introduce it. That's what the church depends on. And they did it. 
they wrapped it up. The most dangerous thing you can do as a Christian is to read Isaiah 41 through 53. You'll leave the church immediately. If you want to stay in the church, never read Isaiah 41 through 53. Never do that. Because then you can say, okay, I have this one chapter. It's out of context. Nobody fulfilled all those prophecies. Everything that happened during the first century is the very opposite of what the Messiah is supposed to do. The Messiah is, no one can die for your sins. No one can. Vicarious atonement is opposed. The notion that an innocent person could die and that death could be an atonement for your sins is antithetical to what the Torah says, antithetical to what the prophet, prophets tell us. And the only way to atone for your sins is to turn to God, to confess your sins to God, to express your regret for your sins, to renounce your sins, and to turn away from your sins. God will forgive you, and your sins will never be remembered against you. How do I know? Because that's what the prophets tell us, Ezekiel 18, 21 through 23. Does God desire at all the death of the wicked? Is it not rather that he turn away from his sinful ways that he may live? Why wouldn't Ezekiel 18 make it into Paul's epistles? If Paul's letters are committed to edifying sin and, most importantly, how you achieve atonement, why didn't Ezekiel 18 make it in? Because it doesn't fit his narrative. The reason why Jesus is not the Messiah is because there's there's no relationship between what Jesus putatively did and what Tanakh says, what the Messiah is supposed to do. Where does salvation, Yeshua, come from? It comes from the creator of the heavens and the earth. That's it. There's no one besides him. There's no savior besides me. That's it. Just read Isaiah 43, verse 10 and 11, and you will leave the church immediately. That's it. Just look at the Bible. Thank you for your question. יציר נברא לעת נעשה בחף צוקו אזי מלך, אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי כבלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נורא והוא היה